This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on February 2nd, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello there, Vincent. I haven't even had a chance to look at the weather, but I'm guessing it's mid-30s and we're just uh, emerging from an ice storm. Ice in Austin. Uh, hmm. Ice in Austin. It has closed down the schools and the businesses for the past three days. Wow. But everything is okay. We have a guest for you today returning for, I don't know how many times, I didn't count a lot, more than most. He is at the University of Pennsylvania Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Paul Offit, welcome back. Thank you. It's fun to be back um, here in Philadelphia, where uh, it is 38 degrees Fahrenheit, 3 degrees centigrade, and sunny, although it's not always sunny in Philadelphia. You're not upstairs in your house. <laughs> no, no, this, this is, I am upstairs, but in the Philadelphia house. So oh, okay. I see. It's in Philly. And, you know, Paul, you are now TWIV adjacent. That's the, that's the phrase that people use. You're, <laughs> you hear so many times that you're TWIV adjacent. All right, we wanted to have you here to talk about the recent Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting uh, uh, for the FDA. And so let me first ask you, um, what, what is the role of this VRBPAC uh, and the FDA? How are they related to one another? So it's an independent advisory committee, a group that is independent of the pharmaceutical industry, independent of the government, that generally has a background in virology, immunology, vaccines, um, that then advises the FDA uh, in terms of vaccines. Um, they, they can choose to ignore our advice, but we <laughs> do ask for our advice. Oh, so it's, was it originally established by the FDA or completely independently? It was. No, I think, well, I think it was established by the FDA. It's, it's like the equivalent of the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices to the CDC, also right. an independent group that advises the CDC. Is it got uh, bacteriologists on it as well? Um, I, what they tend to do, which is what I re actually really like about the so-called VRPAC committee at the FDA, is they will bring in experts to, toward that end. So in other words, when we discussed a few years ago, dengue virus vaccine, which is not a commercial product in, in the continental United States, but is used in, in Puerto Rico, um, they will bring in two or three dengue experts because not everybody around the table has that expertise. So, so if there is a bacteriology issue, they will occasionally bring in expertise if they don't feel that expertise is sitting around the table. Kind of like a study section where you have standing members and ad hocs. Exactly right. And how long have you been on this particular committee, Paul? Right. So I came on in 2017 before COVID hit. And um, and it's a four-year stint, but I was asked to re-enlist uh, in 2021. So I'm going to be there till 2025. By which time this will be all done, right? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. All right. So what was the purpose of this particular meeting, Paul? So there was one voting question, um, which was basically a question about harmonizing the booster schedule with the priming schedule. So the way that that um, question read was, does the committee recommend harmonizing the vaccine strain composition of the primary series and booster series in the United States to a single composition? So, so right now, the booster dosing is not with monovalent Wuhan 1 or ancestral strain mm -hmm. vaccine. It's both Wuhan 1 plus BA4, BA5, and so, which is the Omicron variant. And, and they wanted to do, give the same thing then to children starting at six months of age. So I, I actually read the Verbac, uh, what is it, um, uh, you know, preview stuff, the stuff they sent you. It, it's called the, the FDA briefing. Uh, the briefing, that's, that's the <laughs> word, uh, word I was looking for. Um, it's quite a thorough document, seems to me. And who puts that together? 
Yeah, it's less thorough than usual. Uh, okay. Here's the way it usually works. The way it usually works. So, so, for example, you go back to December 2020 on December 10th when we met to discuss whether we were going to recommend emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine. You get two documents. You get the emergency use authorization submission by the company, which is about 100 pages long. And then you get the FDA's review of that submission to make sure that there's no misrepresentations or omissions where they'll go through all the primary data. So you get 200 pages of data. Okay. When you we consider, for example, the the childhood vaccines, let's say for the 12 to 15 year old or the 5 to 11 year old, and you're considering both vaccines at the same time, you'll get 400 pages of data. Mm. You usually get it about uh, a week before you meet. Here, you know, we got we got about 25 pages of, of information, um, which didn't really include some of the data that were presented. So it's getting scanter, actually. Mm. All right. So this harmonization question, did they say we're going to harmonize to um bivalent for one first, second, third dose, or did they just say harmonize? All doses. So all, all primary series doses that are given to the six-month-old to four-year-old, or the five-year-old to 11-year-old, or 12-year-old to 15-year-old, they will all, all those priming doses will be the bivalent vaccine with Omicron, uh, BA4, BA5, and, and Ancestral. Okay. That's, that's, now, now, obviously, the children over 12, for the most part, get the same dose. Um, so, so and whereas children uh, 11 and less get a lesser dose. And so, for example, if you take Pfizer's vaccine for children, that's a three microgram per dose vaccine. So now what you'll have is you'll have one and a half micrograms of mRNA representing Wuhan 1, one and a half micrograms of mRNA mm -hmm. representing BA4, BA5, for which you don't have any clinical data, you had a little immunological data. But, and, and so the vote on that was 21 out of 21, correct? That's right. It was Which unanimous. includes Paul Offit, right? <laughs> so this time you weren't one of two uh, lone dissenters. So you think we should be using a, a Omicron in our vaccine? You think there are enough data to, to say that? I think it's a lateral move. I, I, I think that the, the vaccines that you had um, just using Wuhan 1 were certainly effective at preventing uh, severe illness in, in, uh, in otherwise healthy people, um, less than, say, 75. And I think what the, the, the data that had been generated here show that immunologically it's, it's, it's a little better, it, it, but meaning you'll have, for example, with the, uh, the bivalent vaccine, you'll have a 1.5-fold increase in neutralizing antibodies to mm -hmm. when we initially looked at data against BA1 and now BA4, BA5. It can be 1.75-fold greater. And there was recently a study done that was published that looked at the effect of this vaccine to uh, induce neutralizing antibodies against BA1 was 1.5-fold difference, BA5, 2.3-fold difference, BA752, 2-fold difference, BQ11, 1.5-fold difference. Uh, do I think that those are clinically significant differences? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the two, I don't think it's no worse, but I, I think people, boosters boost, and I think that if you get a booster dose with this, um, you, we have shown, and Dr. Griffin has gone through the, these studies, that you can um, at least induce short-lived protection against mild disease. And I think for people who are over 65 or have uh, comorbidities or immune compromise, I think you can help keep them out of the hospital. But I, I, don't, I don't think it's really an advance. I, I'd like to think we're going to get to the point where we have a broader look at this. In other words, do we still need to have the Wuhan 1 strain in this mm -hmm. vaccine? I mean, can, can we go to a monovalent vaccine with a higher dose? Can we have dose ranging studies? Maybe we have a multivalent vaccine that cons considers uh, all the circ or at least a representative number of circulating strains, and we haven't really had those discussions. Uh, that was that was one of my main questions: is uh, whether there had been discussion about whether the 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 ancestral strain should even be included in this, and and what the rationale is for maintaining it, other than we know it works. No, I think it's it's probably more. Um, administrative than anything else. In other words, you have essentially an anchor for the FDA because you know you have data on the ancestral strain. So you know you're not losing anything. But I guess I wish there were um, more data um, generated you know, mm -hmm. by studies either supported by the NIH or others where you look at those ranging studies for you know circulating screens. and we're in the Omicron era, um, and so it does make sense to include these strains or it, it, these either presume. I think solely. I don't think. I mean, Wuhan one is gone. I think yeah. it's fair to say it's one not coming back. So I'm not sure what we're getting out of that, except for the fact that you have obviously, you know. Cons conservation, as Daniela Weisskopf said on your uh, program earlier on TWIV, you know, that you have conservation of those T cell epitopes. And I think that that has been served us well in terms of protection against severe illness. There's, there's one thing that 
has always struck me whenever you come on TWIV is that you say there's no evidence that a Omicron is any better than ancestral, even up to this point, in preventing severe disease and hospitalization. Certainly infection, yes, for a few months where the antibody levels remain high, that makes perfect sense that it would even have a protection against infection. But severe disease and hospitalization, I've seen a few studies, one uh, just in the New England Journal, not terribly convincing. Did they present any data on uh, the effect of the bivalent versus the monovalent on hospitalization and severe disease? No. Is a short <laughs> um, I would say that there's only two studies that have been done in any sort of prospective, controlled, randomized manner where you compared mm -hmm. the Mon monovalent vaccine containing Wuhan 1 only with a bivalent vaccine containing an Omicron strain, which was the BA1 strain. So, so that was done in the United States by Moderna. And you have to do it in a randomized manner because you have to control for the time in the pandemic when you're doing this. Yeah. And you have to control for age and comorbidities and immune compromised posts, et cetera, previous exposures. So, so you have to do it at the same time in the pandemic. So it was done here and was shown to find no difference. And then it was done in the UK recently. And it then that paper was actually, uh, as was a preprint, came out the day before we met, so mm -hmm. last Wednesday, the 25th of January. And because, see, they still, they still have the monovalent vaccine there as a booster dose. We don't have that here. Right, right. That, that EUA for that was removed on uh, September 1st, so we couldn't do those studies. But they can, and they did that study, and again— no difference. So the only time people show that the bivalent vaccine is better than the monovalent is when you're looking at, at non-contemporaneous times. When right. You're looking. So you get your booster dose of bivalent nine months later uh, after your last booster, with the, whereas you got yeah. your monovalent four months after your previous booster, begging the question, why did people make those choices? And so you really can't compare them. Yeah, it was a New England Journal paper, Effectiveness of Bivalent Boosters Against Severe Omicron Infection, where... The, the monovalent was months before the bivalent, and so it's longer in time, so a, a longer time for antibody levels to decline. And sure, you're going to find an advantage of the bivalent because it was given, you know, within three months. So I, I don't know, you know, the authors conclude that these the effectiveness of the boosters is higher than monovalent, but I don't think that's a fair comparison. Do you? <laughs> I completely agree. Okay. I, I, I can tell you that... Um, that the, the first paper that uh, that Moderna put out where they looked at, did, did the studies the right way, a few hundred people in each group for monovalent or bivalent, that showed no difference. I mean, that was accepted by the New England Journal of Medicine and published. The second group of data where they had that big difference in terms of when you got that second dose, both in the pandemic mm -hmm. and how long from the previous dose, um, that paper, I think, is struggling to get accepted because they, 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 they can't in any way draw the conclusions they drew, which was that, that the bivalent was better. And you'll hear, this bothers me a lot, actually, is that you'll hear people in the administration that will step up and say, look, the bivalent vaccine is clearly better than the monovalent vaccine. And that's just not true. What I wish they would say is that the, the, the booster doses boost, and it does help, I think, keep people in high-risk groups out of the hospital. I think that's true. There was a paper that was published mm -hmm. uh, in MMW, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, that showed that for those over 65, that, that, that there was a lesser instance of hospitalization. And then recently, actually, there was a paper by Mark Tenford out of the CDC, again showing that the bivalent vaccine um, decreased hospitalizations, and the group was about, had a median age of 76. So, yes, I believe that's true. So say that, because that's, that's true, but don't sell it as something it's not. So the um, uh, this uh, report and this, uh, the discussion seem to have obviously focus on the mRNA vaccines. How does this impact on the uh, Janssen vaccine and the Novavax vaccine? That is the adenovectored vaccine and the protein vaccine. Well, so the J and J vaccine, um, the adenovirus vector vaccine, um, it suffered what was a significant side effect, rare but real and serious, which is that um, that vaccine, as you only knew when you had inoculated hundreds of thousands of people, could activate platelet factor four, cause this clotting cascade, including uh, blood clots in the brain, which could be fatal. And I think when that happened, um, people backed away from the J&J &J vaccine. So although that is a two-dose vaccine, the second dose is mRNA. It's not recommended as a two-dose J&J &J vaccine. And so that really, really hurt that product. I think Novavax, um, 
is is a little bit of a stepchild at the moment. I mean, it is recommended as a booster dose, and it it, it can be given uh, to those over eighteen. Um, but it's just it, it, and if you look at the data that were presented, and they present no facts presented at that meeting. They look pretty good. Um, it it's got a powerful adjuvant, this MF fifty nine adjuvant, which is the same adjuvant that's in Shingrix, and it does appear to to induce broad immunity. And, and the other thing is, you, you know, you have a lot of experience with this kind of vaccine, a purified protein vaccine, which is what we have for the hepatitis B vaccine or the HPV vaccine. And we've had experience with this adjuvant in Shingrix, which is also a single protein vaccine. So uh, it's, uh, I think Novavax will emerge okay. over time. So, so you expect over time that Novavax will step into this bivalent uh, protocol and uh, J&J? Are they? No? Yeah. I, I, don't, I think people will start to, I, I predict that you'll start to see Novavax vaccine used more as a boost. Uh, I think that will happen. And, but I, what I hope happens is that that we, 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 we can step back now. I mean, you know, when, when the virus first entered in January of 2020 or so, and, you know, people, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 people were dying a day. Um, you know, nonetheless, that year, what did we do? We did two huge clinical trials, you know, 40,000 for Pfizer, 30,000 for Moderna. We did those trials the right way. We had a two-month safety follow-up, which is standard. We, that, those trials were just like any other pediatric or adult vaccine trial. And that was when we didn't have monoclonals. We didn't have vaccines. We didn't have antivirals. And people were dying, thousands were dying a day. Now you have all the, well, you don't have monoclonals anymore for the moment, but you do have vaccines, you have antivirals, and you have 96 percent population immunity. Those data were presented to us by the CDC that if you look at sort of serological surveys for people who've been naturally infected or vaccinated or both, you have 96 percent population immunity. Obviously, the incidence of hospitalizations and deaths is way down. So we have time to step back and see how can we move forward, given that this virus is going to continue to circulate for years, if not decades, given that there will always be vulnerable groups? What's the best way to, to one, define who they are and protect them going forward? Because I feel we're just kind of doing these lateral moves. I, I would love to see, um, you know, not only the purified protein vaccine, but, um, you know, potentially other va vaccines given by different routes. If we're considering T cells as being important, maybe it would be interesting to have mRNA representing the nuclear protein in the vaccine. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you'd love to see uh, preliminary data generated so we could make more informed decisions. I, I was a little um, uh, confused by uh, the, they have a table in this document that's the proposed potential simplified immunization schedule uh, that has two bits in it, uh, a one dose recommendation and a, a one dose series, a one dose recommendation and a two dose series. The one dose uh, for, it looks like, uh, if you've had two doses previously, the two dose for if you've had less than one dose previously. And I, in my mind, that would include uh, people who've uh, had no exposure or people who are naive. OK, and I'm a little puzzled by the notion that we're uh, that's a two dose thing. You've said and I, you know, totally get this. This is a three dose vaccine. So is this a does this differ from that? Would this be what would the two dose series? What would be the schedule for that? And and is that does that differ from the three dose idea? Right. So the, the statement that, that that we were given that I think you're, you're alluding to it, it regards future campaigns. So it says simplify, simplify. I guess when you hear somebody saying that they're going to simplify something for you already, you probably should be suspicious. But it says simplifying the immunization schedule for future vaccination campaigns to administer a two dose series in certain young children and in older adults and persons with immune com with compromised immunity and only one dose in all other individuals. I think what they're talking about there is something that I, I, again, don't fully embrace, which is this moving to the flu model, that we have sort of these yearly campaigns based on circulating strains, that everybody gets a yearly vaccine. And I just don't see that for this. this we've, you've talked about this on Twitter before. This, flu viruses aren't influenza viruses. They're, flu is a much more strain-specific phenomenon. In the past 10 years, we, have, we, we sit down every March to pick vaccines for September. There's twice in the past 10 years where we pick the wrong H3N2 strain and missed. And when you miss, you miss badly and you get, you know, sort of less than 10% protective efficacy. 
that's not true. I'm, I'm talking about against serious disease. You, you, here, you're, you're, that's not true for this virus. I mean, you, you, if you've been vaccinated with Wuhan strain and you're not in a high risk group, you appear at least for two months into the availability of the vaccine, you appear to be protected against severe disease because presumably of this conservation of T cell recognition. So this this schedule in the future, it, it sounds to me as if it sort of is a. a, a, a is based on this idea that we already have 96% uh, seropositivity in the population to start with, okay? Because it seems to me, right. it seems to me still, if you were coming into this and you knew for sure you were naive, I would want the three-dose series, okay? Uh, uh, an immunization uh, one month later and then four to six months later. Uh, I agree. Okay. Uh, I think I think we're, we're, we're I th because I'm a pediatrician. The the I think I, I, I if I I'm going to have a grandchild in March, so not that far away from our first grandchild. I mean, I think that when that child is six months a of age, what would I want them to be immunized with? I think I'd probably like them to be immunized either with a a, a monovalent vaccine or, or a di or, or trivalent vaccine. To bivalent, and I, actually it's probably tervalent, right? Because it, you don't want to mix the Greek and the Latin. So a bivalent and tervalent <laughs> vaccine, um, the, the, um, you know, that you would, uh, that would be maybe a cocktail of the circulating strains instead of locking that child into Wuhan 1 again. Because you're not losing anything in two terms of T-cell recognition. You're probably gaining something in terms of entering now into these the better protection against these more immune evasive strains. So there's, there's, that's what I'd like to see. But we'll, and so I'd love to have data on that. So, so presumably shortly the FDA will announce that they're going to harmonize the vaccine composition, as you have said, for that first voting question, right? Assuming they take your advice, right? And so going forward, we're going to have bivalent for everyone. Now that my question is who should be boosted every year? Are we going to say do the flu approach, we're going to boost you, you're going to have three months protection during the winter, and that's it until next winter? Or does not everyone need to get boosted? Right. So what's the goal of the vaccine? The goal of the vaccine yeah. is, according to them, their stated goal even in this document is we need to protect against severe disease. That was always the issue, remember, at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Flatten the curve. Don't overwhelm the healthcare system. You know, de decrease hospitalizations. That was the goal. And and that is an achievable goal. It's an attainable goal. And so, 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 and so, who is most likely to be hospitalized? And we have those data from the CDC. We have those data from the UK. It's it's those high-risk groups that we just mentioned. So Fine. I think it makes sense them to give them that dose. Now, not all of them. Maybe they don't need a dose every year. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that we, the CDC can help us out with that by telling us who's getting hospitalized and, and, and defining okay. them. who's getting hospitalized. How old are they? What are their comorbidities? When was their last dose of vaccine? Did they get antivirals? Let's get those those data in a more granular way so we can make a more informed decision. And then with academic immunologists also, for how long do, does, does memory last? I mean, have, what are the frequencies of memory being T-cells based on all the different factors we just said? And then you can make a more informed decision. I, I think that, that there is... That it is not a reasonable public. And, oh, I'm sorry. Take a step back. I think that that the there are some people for whom even, that are so frail. I think medically that even a mild disease mm -hmm. could land them in the hospital. Um, certainly nursing home patients, et cetera. So, but it's, it's the same high risk groups. So, but otherwise, help, we're trying to prevent a few months of mild disease in, in healthy young people. I, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. So problem. this is just to clarify for listeners because we always get the question. We get a flu vaccine every year. Why do we? Ha What's wrong with getting a COVID vaccine every year? But the point is that if you miss with the flu vaccine, you get severe disease. But as you said, that doesn't happen with COVID. We haven't seen that so far. Not yet. Yeah. Now, now, it may be that, that that a virus, this virus, evolves to being not only immune evasive for protection against mild disease, but immune evasive. Period. In which case, then you really do. Then sure. we are starting all over again. And what worries me about this constant talking about boosters is like the boy who cried wolf. I mean, I think the the people have booster fatigue. I think they're largely not listening anymore. Witness, you know, the government bought 171 million doses of this bivalent booster vaccine, and I think something like 15 percent of that mm. that about. 40 million doses have been distributed. Only something like 11% of people over 65 years of age have gotten this vaccine. So I think the, the public has turned off to this. And it worries me that should this ever really be a real wolf, meaning a, yeah. a yeah. completely resistant strain that we've lost the public's attention. Now, you, you just said you want more data 
from CDC. And I remember there was some discussion at the meeting saying, we don't just want neutralization data. We'd like T-cell data. We want FC effector data and other data. And is that is that a reasonable read of the, the committee's desires? We say it every no. time. And everybody talks about how important it is, and then it doesn't really happen. Uh -huh. I, it happens on your, your program. I think Daniela Weisskopf did a great job of summarizing what we know about T-cells and don't know about yeah. T-cells. But there are a lot of really good T-cell immunologists out there. There's Alessandro Setti and, and Shane Crotty and John Weary here at our place, yeah. our place yeah. at Penn and Daniela. I mean, they, they I, I think what I actually have talked to Peter Marks to some extent about this. Let, let's let's have a one or two day meeting where we get the immunologists mm -hmm. and virologists Talk about the things that we're talking about on Twitter right yep. now. Yep. What's the best path forward? That, that reminds me, we should get John Wary on. He's the T cell immunologist we haven't had yet. That would be good, right? Yep. That would right. be great. Right. Another, so the other discussion topic was about um, when to change the, the booster, right? When do you know when you should not have any Omicron anymore, but something else? Could you tell us, summarize how that went? Right. So, so the, uh, the, the way that, that this read was, I'll read it to you, um, establishing a process for vaccine strain selection recommendations, mm. similar in many ways to that used for seasonal influenza vaccines, based on prevailing and predicted variants that would take place by June to allow for production in September. So this is a one of the advantages of the mRNA vaccines is it does have a faster production cycle, whereas it's, it's closer to six months for flu. Although flu, remember, is, is you know, there's squalene adjuvanted flu vaccines, there's high dose flu vaccines, there's flu block, which is a recombinant DNA vaccine. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to make a flu vaccine. And there's both trivalent or trivalent and and uh, quadrivalent flu vaccine. So it's, it's a little more complicated, but um, again, how would that work? See, look, look at what just happened over the past year. Uh, you know, we, we um, BA1 came in to the United States in sort of December 2021, and by January, February, both companies, Pfizer and Moderna, made a BA1-containing bivalent vaccine. By the time we sat down on June 28th, BA1 was gone. <laughs> And so the, the implication was, okay, let's make a BA4, BA5 containing vaccine because that made up in June 95% of circulating strains. Both those vaccines, both those, those viruses are essentially gone. Yeah. So what's the plan? Now, we're still in the Omicron era. So, so you're certainly closer with those, mm. vi those, uh, those mRNA products than you were, say, with, with Wuhan. And I think you probably do, especially if you're, if you're just seeing this for the first time, you, you, you know, as compared to people who've been primed and boosted and boosted with Wuhan, where you have to climb this tremendous imprinting hill. I think for people who haven't really been primed and boosted and boosted with Wuhan 1, who are now exposed to this, this uh, one of the Omicron variants, one or more of the Omicron variants, you probably get a better neutralizing antibody response, which for some, I think, may help mm. keep you out of the but hospital. What, but what, what will you look for? So for flu, we look for increased uh, disease caused by immune evasion. So is that what you would look for for changing the, the booster for, for COVID vaccines? I, I think what they're talking about is, is, is what's circulating. Yeah. I mean, the way it works in, uh -huh. in uh, for flu is you look at uh, countries that have winters before that precede yours, like Australia or South America. And that often predicts really well what comes into this country. We're, yeah, we're usually yeah. right. This year we were right. I think everybody thinks we're sitting around with like uh, sock puppets and a magic eight ball to figure this out. But we <laughs> actually really do get this right typically. And um, and here, though, it's different because, I mean, look at just what happened over the past year with this sort of ever shifting yeah, yeah. strain. I mean, how do you pick those? So strains? I wonder, relevant to this, I wonder a couple of things. First of all, whether this is really seasonal. Uh, and if so, what that looks like. And second, yeah. I kind of wonder, and I don't know, this is, I guess, sort of intuitive. I wonder if a lot of this variation isn't this virus still kind of settling into the population. And if over time, it'll settle down and be a little more stable. Do you have any thoughts on either of those, seasonality and stability of the variant situation? Yeah, well, so seasonal is a little more, more uh, I think, uh, something I can probably at least venture a guess on better. But you're right. When would you give that vaccine? I mean, is, will this settle into being just your typical winter respiratory virus, which is more typical of, say, influenza respiratory syncytial virus? I mean, those viruses come into our hospital at a pretty standard time every year. This virus has continued to circulate throughout the year. So when would you give it? In terms of how this virus evolves, I wouldn't begin to make a guess about this. I mean, it, it's interesting, though, right? So, so Wuhan 1 raises 
loses its head in, in Wuhan in October, November 2019. So then D614G, right, the first variant, this more contagious variant, leaves China, sweeps across Asia, Europe, the U.S., only to be replaced by the Alpha variant, to then to be replaced by the Delta variant. Then by So that's the first year, the first two years. Then December 2021, so you're, you're two years into this, Omicron hits. And now you just have this, this, this whole assemblage of Omicron variants, meaning either recombination events or sort of evolving events within the same strain. And so it's, but it's all Omicron. I mean, I, I'm really curious to see a paper that's, that's published, you know, that's called, you know, where is pie? <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe the song, right. you know, where yeah. is, where is pie, you know, to the tune of, you know, where is love from <laughs> Oliver. I think that would be where is pie? So do you think that the plan is simply to make a new booster or a new vaccine because it's going to be harmonized, right? Every year as to match whatever is circulating without any regard for whether it's needed or not? Well, I hope not. I, mean, I, I hope, I hope the, 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 that, that we're always driven by data. And, and the, the, the critical data is that I, I think it is clear that this virus will continue to evolve and continue to, to be part of our lives and, and presumably enter the pantheon of winter respiratory mm -hmm. viruses. Mm -hmm. And so how and I think you're, you're right, Rich. I mean, I think we'll learn about this over time in terms of how it does settle in. But I, I guess I, I'd also like to have just for us, I mean, for our, our committee, uh, a group of sort of evolutionary uh, virologists who's and biologists who sit around and, and, and try and at least seeing what they've seen make those kind of predictions so we can be better at picking these strains. I, I think if you pick any sort of in the Omicron group, um, I mean, look at all these re recombination events that have happened, um, you know, that you're probably better served than with, with Wuhan 1 over time. But, but what happens a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? I just, I just I fear, Paul, that, that you will get some neutraliza neutralization data, which shows that this year's Omicron, if you use it, you get one and a half fold higher neutralization antibodies, and they're going to ask you to approve it as, as a booster or not. That's what I fear without really a good reason, as you have said, going forward. Well, you know, if, if you if real answer, I mean, if you so so look at what look at what just happened. The, the last two times we met, we met on June twenty eighth to answer a question about bivalent vaccines. Did, did we agree with approving? The, the question was actually, do you approve a BA one containing bivalent mm -hmm. vaccine? That's the question we were asked on June twenty eighth. Well, BA one was gone. Right. And everybody said that, and so the implication was, okay, we'll use a BA four five vaccine. We'll do that. Well, the next day. The Biden-Harris administration announced that they had purchased 105 million doses of, of Pfizer's vaccine. Let's assume that didn't happen in a day. Let's assume that that was well in the yeah, works for sure. a while. So I think when they asked us that question, they they knew that that answer was going to be yes. And we were we were sort of um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. The way those data were presented was, um, you know, you had a, a Contra Subaraf from uh, from the WHO a Technical Advisory Group saying, you know, she felt that this might be a benefit. You had people from the FDA presenting to us saying they think we might this might be a benefit. So we voted yes, and but that was that was done. Uh, you could argue the same thing just happened last mm -hmm. Thursday, which is that we voted yes on the question of a bivalent vaccine for children. Now those vaccines, the minute we voted yes, that those vaccines are essentially available. So those countries had companies have been making them. And when they were making them, I suspect they weren't making those monovalent primary series doses. And so it, what if we'd said no? If we'd said no, um, and the, the FDA followed our advice, how much vaccine was available? For the, yeah. There was still available for the monovalent vaccine. How, how, what was its expiry date? I, I suspect we couldn't have voted no, really. Yeah. So I want to back up for a minute and make sure I've got the overview here. What is the, relative to the current situation, what is the impact of this decision? Let's just kind of summarize. I think it's a lateral decision. I, th I think we're. I think, think we were we're where we were. I think that these these as a priming series, the bivalent vaccines as a priming series will be as good as what we had. The immunogenicity data presented on children was was as good. Well, much often is made of a 1.5 fold difference or 1.75 fold difference. I don't think those are clinically significant differences, but it's not worse and and um, maybe a little better for the immun mm -hmm. for for someone who's naive to these viruses. Uh, and it's a lateral but, move. But generally, this takes the monovalent vaccine out of the picture, and now we have just one vaccine, a bivalent vaccine, with a certain composition for the time being, okay? 
Well, so and maybe it's a stepwise thing. Maybe that's what, maybe it's like what we did with the polio vaccine back in the late 1990s when we had an, an oral polio vaccine. We wanted to move to the inactivated vaccine, but we had a step in the middle, which was first you get two doses of IPV, mm-hmm. then two doses of OPV, and then we went to all IPV. And maybe that's what this is. Maybe we're moving away from Wuhan one, and this is our right. first step. Okay. All right, and Paul, when when someone needs a booster, the, the high risk populations that you mentioned. Would that be something you would get in the fall, or could it be any time? I guess we'll, we'll, we'll learn. <laughs> uh, is, is this virus more uh, likely to be transmitted, more likely to cause hospitalization and death in the winter? This winter has been, you know, everybody kept talking about how we were wait till, you know, Christmas, yeah. wait till you know, January 1st. When New Year's, wait till everybody comes back from vacation. You're going to see a burst. Everybody kept talking about that burst, but we haven't really had it. So Rich's question is a good one. Your question is a good one. What is the seasonality of this? Because that, that okay. means everything in terms of when you're going to give a vaccine, especially if you're just buying yourself a few months of protection against mild do, Are the other human coronaviruses, do they have a seasonality? Um, yes. I would say that, that they, the answer to that question okay. is yes. Uh, in, our, in our hospital, I would say that the four strains of circulating human coronaviruses account for maybe 15 to 20 percent of what we see in the winter months, but it's really primarily the winter months. It's also interesting, uh, and Stanley Perlman, who's on our committee, who actually chaired that last uh, meeting as a coronavirus expert, did say something that was interesting because, you, you, you know, you know that for this virus, SARS-CoV-2, that there's clearly been an evolution that we've been following. Well, how about the other strains of human yeah. coronaviruses? Do they too evolve, you imagine they do. And and he said, yes, very much so. He said, if you look at sort of Sierra now and then look back at those strains that initially circulated, that there's very little neutralizing activity. So they, they, they too evolve. I, I want to point out that, as you said, some people had very dire predictions for this res- this winter respiratory virus season. And they, and at least for SARS-CoV-2, they really have not uh, been borne out. And I think... Uh, Someone at the FDA, uh, I think Peter Mark said, "Oh, it's disaster! It's going to be disastrous." And um, so that's th- that's what you get for predicting, <laughs> <laughs> especially for viruses. So right now, right now, if only if you're in some kind of high risk group, should you get a booster? Is that fair? That that's what I think. I, because I think that's where the data lie. I mean, when when if if a parent comes into my office and says, a parent of a sixteen year old who's had three doses of vaccine, should I get a booster dose? My answer is no. So therefore, that's okay. why I voted no. <laughs> I just can't. I don't. I don't see the data for that. Other than you know, protection of short lived protection against mild illness, and that's not the and goal. And if the uh, if the FDA wanted to change the the composition of the vaccine, say in twenty twenty three. You would start. You would look at that in June meeting. Is that how the timing goes? It's not, that sounds like it's playing pretty close. I, I would think it would probably would be in, in all practical purposes. It would be April. Would be my right. guess as right. to how that would play. And then by f- also remember, it's not just a matter of production. The the the, the this is this is we're moving. Uh, out of the emergency, right? We're no longer yeah. call. We're about to not call this an emergency anymore. When you do that, a, a few things happen. First of all, who's paying? Uh, secondly, and more importantly, that means there are there is no more emergency use authorization. Right. These, these have to be licensed mm-hmm. products, and some of them are still under EUA. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But I do think also c- groups need to buy the vaccine, so they need time to put those orders in place and stuff. So you can't just it doesn't happen with the snap of a finger. May's right around the corner. Are we done for this year? Are we doing? Uh, are we looking at 2024? Or are we going to have to uh, 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 look at what's circulating in May, June of this year? Well, again, you're asking me to predict, and I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think I think we're not done. My right. guess would be that we will meet right. again and discuss okay. what's circulating. And Paul will come back on TWIV afterwards and Great. tell us all about it. Thank you. We really appreciate it. That's a special episode of TWIV. Uh, with Paul Offit. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv if you want to send in a question or a comment. Twiv at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our communication, consider supporting us. Uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. Paul Offit, University of Pennsylvania and CHOP. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Rich, Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Jolene for the timestamps, and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>